Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to East Central Missouri and the world, and welcome to the James Strong Show podcast, podcast number 352. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for making us a part of your day. I appreciate it. This podcast was recorded on the afternoon of Sunday, March the 3rd, from the James Strong Studio in Western St. Charles County. Friends, this weekend in St. Louis, in East Central Missouri, has just been fantastic yesterday was sunny and 69 i think i got to in 68 69 degrees beautiful weather uh today it's going to be about 10 degrees warmer than that so uh actually i slept with the windows open last night just a little bit because it got get that got down to 48 degrees but with that window cracked you could feel the nice breeze coming through and you could hear the sounds outside it was just just magnificent um while <laughs> March the 3rd does not mean that winter time is over in East Central Missouri, not by a long shot. Uh, but what it does mean is if we get smacked again, it won't be too hard and it definitely won't be for too long. Uh, in fact, the long range forecast the next 10 days shows, I think it dips down into the thirties once or twice in the evening. Other than that, it's, it's, it's warming. I mean, the normal, the normal warm, the normal high around this time of year is about 55 degrees. So with everybody knows we have global warming. So it's probably going to be a little bit more than that. So life is really good here. And, and, and while spring really isn't officially over to, or officially starting to what the 20th, 21st of March, something like that. Um, the little bit that may be left of winter is quickly losing the wind in its sails. Had a trip this week, uh, went to Pennsylvania and New Jersey on business. And uh, the trips, the trip was a good trip. And and actually, the weather was not nearly as good as, uh, as East Central Missouri. It was basically, for the most part, uh, a lot of rain and maybe the 50s. Uh, it was, I guess, seasonal for that part of the country. You're up in the, in the mountains, uh, the Poconos, the Appalachians, whatever they call them in that part of the country, a little bit of both. But, uh, but yeah, the weather was not nearly as good, but it wasn't too bad. But the trip started out right. Uh, rental cars have become, I'll just say, interesting. I scratch my head when it comes to the rhyme or reason for the prices on rental cars. The last couple of rentals I've had, uh, if you go to the website, and I usually use Enterprise because it's a local company. They they do a good job. Uh, they have a lot of locations that aren't necessarily at airports, and I use them all. So I generally, and, and they're about the same prices as anybody else. So I rent from Enterprise for the most part. Um, when you go on their website, they list the cars cheapest to most expensive so you would think that the cheapest would be the subcompact then the compact then the midsize and the full size and the standard size it's not that way it's not that way at all in fact this time of year normally the cheapest car is the minivan you think well why would a minivan be less expensive than a compact car well think about it minivans are rented in the summertime okay when everybody has to have a family and friends they will rent those cars at 150 dollars a day because if you're on vacation and you got a bunch of kids you don't have a choice uh i guess you get a full-size suv instead of a minivan those are 200 dollars a day so all the big vehicles cost a lot um now a big suburban or a tahoe uh something like that sure uh Business, businessmen are going to want to rent that because they're cool cars. Businessmen never want to rent a minivan because that's that's a soccer mom car, okay? So usually the cheapest car is a minivan. And I get them because like the Chrysler Pacifica, it's a good, comfortable car. Quite often they're hybrids. So if you get a Chrysler Pacifica hybrid, you're going to get uh, in the low to mid-30s for gas mileage. So they're comfortable. They get good gas mileage. Why wouldn't you want that vehicle, Okay. But the last couple of times, the cheapest car they've had is not a minivan, not a compact or some compact, uh, not the wee picket choice, which is sometimes a choice, and that can be anything from uh, a very nice car to a little econo box. But for the most part, you're going to get something in between. The last two times, the cheapest car has been a premium car. That's a step up from a full size or a, or a standard size. It's a premium car usually Nissan Maxima or similar, okay? 
And I've been getting that. Well, here's what I did this last time. I got the premium car, Nissan Maxima or similar. And uh, they said, yeah, we don't have any of those. So we're going to give you a Suburban. I said, I don't want a Suburban. They get 12 miles a gallon. They're hard to park. I don't want a Suburban. Thank you. But sir, this is a no charge upgrade. Okay. But sir, I didn't rent that. I don't want that. I want a premium car. Well, we don't have any premium cars. Okay. Well, what can you do for me? Well, I can give you a Chevy Suburban. I said, stop it. I don't want that big behemoth that gets 12 miles a gallon and I can't park. So we talked to the boss and the boss says, yeah, give him that. It was an Audi A4. I said, thank you. So in the rain and the mountains, I got to rent a Audi A4 Quattro. Very nice car. Super car. In fact, back in 2018, 2017, 2018, when I bought my Jaguar, uh, that was one of the cars I test drove, an Audi A4. I test drove the Audi A4, the Jaguar XE, the BMW 3 class, the Mercedes C-Class, and the Cadillac uh, A something or another. Uh, And I chose the Jaguar. The Audi was fine. I thought it was a little um, eh, not sporty enough, maybe more on the comfort side. I wanted something more on the sporty side. I chose the Jaguar because the Audi was a little bit too cushy. And the BMW was a little bit too sporty. The Jaguar was somewhere in between, which is why I chose the the Jaguar XE. But that Audi A4, it was magnificent. It was wonderful. The reason I tell this story is if you're ever in a situation at a rental car company, especially if you have status with them, especially if you're a frequent customer, or even if you're not, if you've reserved a certain car and they don't have it, be nice, be cordial, don't scream, yell, stomp, and curse, but just say, look, this is what I rented. It's kind of what I want. It's, it's what you promised me, right? Now, if they say Nissan Maxima or similar, and they give and they don't have Nissan Maximas, well, you're going to get what you ha- they have. Um, make sure they don't try to give you a Kia Rio, but you need to get something in that class, okay? If they don't have it, just be nice, kind, courteous, yet persistent, and you'll get bumped up. I've gotten, I've done this before. I got it. One time I got a, uh, a, uh, Alfa Romeo Stevlio. Uh, I've gotten a, uh, a Volkswagen Atlas. Uh, I've gotten lots of very, very cool cars just because I was a bit persistent. So consider doing that the next time you're renting a car and they don't have what you like, especially if you've rented a premium or better. If you rent a midsize or better, they may say, ah, we're going to bump you up to a full size, which is Chevy Malibu, which is really not a huge upgrade. But anyway, for what it's worth, there you go. The airplane flight was also, I guess I'll say memorable. Um, Boeing has been in the press for a lot of bad things. Uh, that, that 737 Max, that was a huge misfire on their part. If you remember, they grounded those planes for a long time because two of them crashed. Uh, one of them from an Indonesian Airlines, the other one, I don't know, Ethiopian. I forget who what it was. It was a, it was another uh, third world country. Okay, and basically, they crashed because the software was wrong. And Boeing's excuse was, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but basically, Boeing's excuse was, well you know, there's an override for that software if it doesn't work, but they didn't buy the option. What? You mean safety for the plane is an option that you have to pay extra for? Come on, folks. Boeing had a huge misstep there. And then recently on the, was it the 737 MAX 9s, I think? I think we had flew a MAX 8. So they're a little bit different. But the, the doors came off, and it looks like it's because, well, they didn't put the bolts in. And then Boeing says, hey, that wasn't our fault. That was uh, the guy who built the doors for us. Well, stop it. It's your plane. You're responsible, okay? So they've had some missteps. That being said, Boeing makes a good plane. And that 737 MAX, friends, is the second coolest plane, I the third coolest plane I've ever been on. Uh, the coolest plane I've ever been on, it, it, they're flying right now, are those, uh, was it 787 Dreamliners? Those Dreamliners are fantastic. 
Uh, normally they save them for overseas flights, but not always. Sometimes you'll get them for a, uh, a West Coast flight or something like that. But uh, if you get a chance to fly on a dream, fly on a Dreamliner, they are wonderful. Uh, the other very cool plane is the uh, the big Airbus. What is it, a 340, I think? I may have the number wrong. But that's the big double-decker plane that holds something like 500 people and takes <laughs> about two hours to load. I'm not exaggerating, okay? You figure, well, strong, come on, you're exaggerating. No, 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 it holds about 500 people. A 737, which takes about 20 minutes to hold, to load, carries a little over 100. This has four times the people. What's 20 minutes times four? That's right. Well, it's not quite two hours, but you get, you get the picture, okay? It takes a long time to load this plane, but it's a double-decker plane. It's huge. It can't land everywhere. You'll never see them at Lambert because... The runway isn't big enough. It's not wide enough. It's not long enough. Uh, But the third coolest plane I've ever been on is this 737 MAX. And what makes it so cool is, first of all, it's new. The lighting is fantastic. It's, it's It's the same size, but it seems like it's bigger. They've engineered it differently. And there's plenty of luggage for everybody. They actually made the luggage bins bigger. Because they could. Some an engineer said, hey, let's make these luggage bins a little bit bigger. And they did. So basically, if you're flying flying on Southwest Airlines and carrying on your luggage and you're you're your C97, you're gonna be able to put your luggage in probably. Okay. I love the 737 Max planes. Am I afraid to fly them? No, I'm not. Um because if you have an airline or an airplane that has a problem and Even two problems in a row, let's say. Chances of a third problem in a row happening is almost non-existent. And I put my money where my mouth is. And and, and, and if if you remember, dear listeners, sometime back, probably maybe six years ago, something like that, uh, those two Malaysian planes disappeared, okay? And nobody wanted to fly Malaysian Airlines anymore. Nobody. Because two planes in a row crashed. One of them just disappeared, I think. They never did find it, okay? So nobody wanted to fly Malaysian Airlines. Well, I was doing a uh, country jumping trip in Asia at that time. And I flew from, I think, the Philippines to Kuala Lumpur, and then Kuala Lumpur, I think, to Saigon. And the flights were like $40 a piece. And the boss said, how did you get a $40 flight? I mean, that, that, the, the, the Philippines to Kuala Lumpur is like a, like a three-hour flight. It cost you $45, something like that. I said, check out the airline. And he looked at it, and his eyes got big. He said, you flew Malaysian Airlines? I said, yeah, why not? Well, they just crashed a couple of planes. I said, yeah, but they're not going to crash a third. Think about it. 40 bucks a flight, 45 bucks a flight, empty. They treated you like a king. And that plane wasn't going to crash, and it didn't. Same thing, in my opinion, with the 737 MAX. They've had so many problems with that plane that they're really, really checking on them. Uh, Now, if I don't have a podcast 353 because I'm on an airplane that crashed, the strong man was wrong. If I do the next podcast because the planes don't crash, I was right. Plan on me having another podcast. Okay. Okay. Uh, did I even talk about the pot, the subject of today's podcast? I didn't, I didn't, I'm, I'll talk about it in just a minute. One more thing I wanted to mention before we get on to the, um, the essay today. And actually it's on, uh, remembering Bob Heil, Bob Heil, uh, was a sound pioneer and he passed away a couple of days ago. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about him, his life and his contribution to the music and radio and satellite and television industry. So that's uh, Bob Heil is going to be the topic of today's uh, essay. Um, one more thing before I get on to the essay about Bob Heil, however, uh, is baseball. Baseball season has begun. Spring training has begun, actually. Uh, and what do you learn about in spring training? Well, really nothing. Everybody's trying to figure stuff out. Uh all the ball players show up in the best shape of their life, ready to play. Yeah, this year's going to be different. Okay, but they always say that. But it's baseball season. It's going to be 78 degrees outside. The ball game's going to be on television. Practice game. Spring training game. Either way, it's fine. It's going to be on TV. But baseball has changed dramatically since, since I was a boy. 
And it's not just the game. It's not just the cyber metrics, the statistics, uh, because players right now, they, they, they concentrate teams. They concentrate on launch angle and pitch count and velocity and ball movement and stuff that to me is, is minutia. Okay. What's important is how many hits did the guy get? And what's most important is how many games did he win? Now, Winning the game is everything. Uh, a few years back, they had a pitcher. Uh, his name escapes me. Pitched for the Mets. Good pitcher. Don't get me wrong. Uh, when he pitches, he's he's hurt at least half the time. But he won the Cy Young Award. And his record was like eight and fifteen. How can you win the Cy Young Award when you're eight and fifteen? Doesn't matter how good a pitcher you are. You didn't win games for your team. A good pitcher wins games that are two to one. A bad pitcher loses games three to two. Which, before we get into the life of Bob Heil, who, who died a little while ago, I'll go off on a caveat. There was a, a, a ball player, uh, Jose De Leon, who pitched for the Cardinals, who died this week. He was 63. And Jose De Leon, while I don't mean to speak poorly of the dead, used to be called Jose De Loser. His ERA was fantastic. His pitch velocity was very good. His ball moved. Everybody said, look, this guy on paper should be a bad pitcher. But he couldn't win a ball game. Jose De Leon would lose the game. If, if, if the team got 10 runs for him, he'd give up 11. If the team got one run for him, he'd give up two. It's just that, like he couldn't win. He just lost all the time. And he went from team to team to team to team to team thing. Okay, we can straighten this guy out. And nobody could straighten the guy out because he didn't. He didn't have what it took to win the game for whatever reason. Lots of talent, couldn't win. That's where baseball has changed. Ball players nowadays, um, Josh Hader is a free agent. And he said, look, I'm not pitching more than 60 games a year. And I'm not pitching two games in a row. And they asked him why they said, well, because I'm going to be a free agent next year. I don't want to hurt myself. And I want to make sure I'm a, I, I make the big, get the big contract. <laughs> what? You want to make sure you get the big contract. So the heck with the team that you play for, you just want the money, which I get that. But when the boss says, look, I, 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 you pitched yesterday. Thank you. We need you today. Sorry, chief. If I hurt myself, I'm not going to get the big contract. Oh, and by the way, he's got a big contract. He's still not pitching two days in a row because three years from now when his first con when this contract runs out, he wants to sign another one. Translation, he's not going to do as the boss says. He's not going to do whatever he can to help the team win because if he does that, he'll probably only earn about 60 or $70 million in his career, not $167 million. Okay. Now, is it selfish that he should want the extra $100 million for being talented? Maybe. Actually, no, I'll say no, it's not. But it is if you don't put the team first. If your number one priority is not, look, I'm on this team to win a championship. If that's not your number one priority, I don't want you. But then... Teams aren't exactly getting in line to hire me as their manager or general manager. Now are they? Okay, let's get on today with today's uh, essay, Remembering Bob Heil. Bob Heil was a, a giant in the sound industry, okay? Uh, he was an American sound and radio engineer, uh, both, well, both I mean, he was well-known. Uh, I found out about Bob Heil when I was a child, and I would listen to Jim White, the big bumper on KMOX in the evening. And uh, he'd have this, this sound guy, Bob Heil. And he knew Bob Heil because they were both ham radio operators. And Bob was a guy who lived in Belleville, had his sound company. And they talk about, you know, radios and microphones and transmitters and all this kind of stuff. And I found it kind of interesting. But Bob Heil was a giant in the rock and roll industry and the cable TV industry and the uh, microphone industry. He was just a huge 
huge guy from St. Louis, lived lived most his whole life in, in Belleville, Fairview Heights area. Uh, he was an American sound and radio engineer who's most well-known for creating a template for the modern rock sound system. Yeah, basically, when a rock and roll group plays in a stadium, that's Bob Heil that invented that, Okay. He founded a company called Heil Sound back in 1966, which went on to create unique touring sounds for the Grateful Dead, the Who, and many, many other bands. Um, He invented what they called the Heil Talk Box. Yeah, the Talk Box. He invented that in 1973. Uh, Peter Frampton used it, and Frampton and Frampton Comes Alive. Joe Walsh used it. Richie Sambora used it um, in in Bon Jovi. Uh, And many... Musicians still use it today. Bob Heil was an innovator in the field of amateur radio, manufacturing microphones, manufacturing satellite dishes for broadcasters, and live sound engineers. In fact, in the late 1980s, Heil Sound became one of the first American companies to create and install home theaters. In fact, I remember Jim White talking about home theaters, and and they would have Bob Heil on. He was also the first manufacturer invited to exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's what the, how much they thought of him. Born back in 1940 in St. Louis, he became a proficient theater organ musician when he was 14. In fact, when he was 14, he would perform at various local restaurants. At age 15, he became the house player for the Big Wolitzer organ at the Fox Theater in St. Louis. At 15. Now, during that time, this was a this is a big deal. During that time, he learned how to tune and voice the thousands of pipes on that great Wolitzer that sits in the Fox Theater. Now, that was a platform that taught Heil how to listen and mentally dissect distinct tones, which became so important throughout his several careers. Now, in his teens, he also became an avid Amateur radio operator began designing and building homemade transmitters, amplifiers, and antenna systems. In his early 20s, Heil began began designing and building various theater pipe organs for the installations at the Holiday Inn North restaurant in St. Louis. And he played the instrument there six nights a week. Now, after having played the organ for eight years solid, he opened up a successful music shop in the small town of Marissa, Illinois. Then, as I said earlier, he filed, he found, uh, founded Heil Sound in 1966. And he was experimenting with live sound systems and becoming the technician to several venues around St. Louis, from auditoriums to bowling alleys, that sort of thing, okay? Now, large sound systems at the time were, they were very weak, very primitive. In fact, you may remember in 1965, when the Beatles played at, at Shea Stadium, and Bush Stadium for that matter, they used a... Shore Vocal Master PA system plugged into the baseball park's announcement system. The sound was horrible. And picture this. Picture back in the 70s when you go to the ballpark. Now banning for the Cardinals, number 20, Lou Brock. Okay. Basically, they just plugged the microphones into that. Echo, 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 echo. It was unlistenable. When the Beatles played in St. Louis... I think they played five songs and were done within an hour. And you think to yourself, well, that's no kind of money. But basically, it's probably all the people's ears could stand. The sound was so terrible. An hour was enough, probably more than enough. Now, here's where Heil started making a big deal out of his sound system. The first time. And it was in February, February 2nd, 1970. And the Grateful, the Grateful Dead were scheduled to play a concert at the Fox Theater in St. Louis. Now, for the tour, they were using a sound system ran and developed by a guy named Bear Osley. Now, Osley had a problem, a drug problem, and he had a pending drug charge for producing copious amounts of LSD and was under orders not to leave the state of California. Now, on February 1st, he did leave the state of California for New Orleans to help the Grateful Dead with the show. Well, the police caught him. They detained him. And they detained the sound system that he had, which belonged to the Grateful Dead. Bottom line is the Grateful Dead were coming to St. Louis to the Fox Theater without a sound system. Now, George Bales, who was a stagehand at the Fox Theater, gave Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead Bob Hiles' phone number. And Hiles remembers Garcia saying to him, Hey, man, 
I heard you had a really big PA. Now, Heil had been toying and tinkering with the large speakers at the Fox, and actually, they'd re- they'd, he had replaced them a month earlier with a new system. So, Heil had the old one because he replaced it with the new one. He asked the guys at the Fox, what do you want to do with the old one? They said, ah, you can have it. Well, he was tinkering with it, okay? Now, Heil was one of the two organists of the Mighty Woolitzer at the Fox, and he had these old systems that he had fixed up. Uh, they were big, massive uh, Altec Lansing A4 speaker cabinets. And he replaced those 15-inch speakers with JBL D140s. And he added an array of four radial horns and ring tweeters, all driven by Macintosh amplifiers. This was unheard of. Hal said that made a huge difference. It was like a big hi-fi system that you could broadcast on. Nobody was putting radial horns into PA systems, so this was very unique. In fact, the horns would give the system intelligibility. Translated, you can actually understand the lyrics. Well, Heil also brought in a modifying uh, Langvin Studio recording console uniquely adapted for live work. Now, he had a buddy that helped him out. This buddy's name was Tomlinson Holman. Uh, he was a young state student at the University of Illinois. He helped him wire this thing, get it all set up. Oh, by the way, have you heard the name of Tomlinson Holman? Maybe. After working with Bob Heil on this, he went on to create the THX Theater Sound System. <laughs> yeah, that was Bob Heil's buddy, okay? Uh, Heil created an electronic crossover to the console to cover speaker output. Now, Beyond the PA system that night, Heil also supplied the mixers, saying that his two roadie buddies, Peter Kimball and John Lloyd, they knew all the Grateful Dead songs, and they were big Grateful Dead fans. So that night, they moved the PA, set it up, and they mixed the show. Heil also had a unique technique to handle the feedback problems, because think about it. If everything's that loud, you're going to have feedback problems with the microphone. Well, here's what he did. He said he would run the microphones out of phase from the monitors, something that nobody else had even tried yet. Nobody was doing this. And since they were out of phase with the microphones and the FOH system, anything that leaked from the monitors would just be canceled out. As a result, he could get those things incredibly loud before they fed back. And Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead loved it. The show was a huge success, and the Grateful Dead asked Bob Heil, his crew, and his sound system to join him on the road. Heil's setup would later become a template for the modern concert touring sound system. Yeah, that was Bob Heil. Now, after he was touring with the Dead, Billboard magazine reported publicly that, quote, a small Midwestern sound purveyor had snagged the Grateful Dead and did a great job. Well, the Who saw this. The not, not, not the Who's on first, The Who. The band, The Who. They saw this. And shortly after the article, Howe received a call from the management of The Who. They'd been experiencing a bumpy start to the U.S. tour. The sound wasn't right. And Howe brought a more refined and powerful version of his sound system to their shows. It was an upgrade from the Grateful Dead stuff. In fact, Howe said, we did The Who's next, who's next to, for, tour for a year and a half all across the U.S., Europe, and then back to the U.S. The tour created a bond between Heil and Who guitarist Pete Townsend, who commissioned Heil to create the quadraphonic sound system he had envisioned for the live tour and the release of their LP called Quadrophilia. So they named the Who named an album after Bob Heil's sound system. They thought the sound system was so cool, they named the album after it, Okay. Now, according to Heil, Heil said that they set up two channel Midas consoles together, put the speakers in four corners, and were able to fly Roger Daltrey's voice around the room. That's what quadraphonic sound did, and that was Bob Heil. They put speakers in all four corners and were able to fly his sound all around the room. Now, at Madison Square Garden, when they hooked it up, the PA was enormous, but they had six, uh, eight, six to eight 15 inch speaker bins, six, eight radial horns and about a dozen tweeters. They could get up to around 110, up to 115 decibels before feedback started. 115 decibels friends is huge. It's loud. And before this people just expected feedback period. The who loved it because the who loved loud. 
Heil also toured with uh, multiple of other groups in the 70s. Joe Walsh, Peter Frampton, Jeff Beck, and others. As I mentioned before, he created Heil Sound, which is based in Fairview Heights, Illinois. And he manufactures a variety of microphones for professional use along uh, with gear for amateur radio enthusiasts. In fact, I'm currently broadcasting on a Heil, Heil PR40. I've been doing that for years. The headset I had on my head is a Heil Pro Set 3. So I've got Heil, Heil mics and a Heil headset. That's what I use in my podcasts every day. And how do I sound? Not trying to brag, but listen to some podcasts, okay? Listen to this dopey podcast that I do in the spare bedroom of my house, okay? And compare it with some of these guys who are really big-time podcasters. There's no echo. There's no feedback. There's no... The sound is great. It's because I use Heil sound equipment. It's good stuff. and It's not any more expensive than anybody else's. Trust me. In fact, the Heil talk box was made famous by Joe Walsh. It was made famous by Peter Frampton. It was made famous by Richie Sambora when he played with... Uh, John Bon Jovi. It was the first high-powered talk box on the market which could rely, be reliably used on high-level rock stages. Because you could use it in the studio, but you couldn't use it live, okay? The first Heil talk box was built for Joel Walsh's Barnstorm Tour. It was developed in 1973. Now, Heil later sold the rights to Dunlop Manufacturing, but Peter Frampton frequently used the Heil box. On, a, on 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 all kinds of stuff. Now, now, when did he get it? He he used the same Heil talk box that he got from Bob Heil for a Christmas present <laughs> back in 1974. He used it prominently on his 1975 album Frampton Comes Alive. In the late 1970s, Heil Sound entered the amateur radio market, with uh, Heil working to fix his perception of problems in the industry involving poorly transmitted and receiving and received audio. He uh, applied science he had learned from a variety of people that worked for Bell Labs. Uh, he developed his HC series of microphones intended for an amateur radio communication. Heil Sound was also, get this, Heil Sound was also an early installer, installer of large satellite dishes for radio. That's how the networks broadcast today. Now, in 20, 2011, Heil became a host of a weekly ham radio newscast called Ham Nation on Leo Laporte's, that's Leo Laporte the Tet guy, his Twit network. And I remember this because people have been bugging Laporte to become a ham for many, many years. And finally he did it, and he loved it. He was hooked. And who did he hire to do a podcast on his network? Of course, the biggest ham guy of all. Bob Heil. Now, in the late 80s, Heil entered the home theater market that was starting to become popular in the U.S. His company became one of the first to design and install custom home theater systems nationally, locally, and nationally, with over 3,000 audiovisual systems installed in 2010 alone. He installed the very first DDS system. And where did that go? Into the office of Bob Costas. He also was the original on the original test team for the RCA Direct TV Dish Network system. Yeah, that was Bob Heil too. Now he consistently worked as a teacher and a lecturer, often appearing in at major electronic and satellite conventions. He taught classes at CES, at the NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters in Las Vegas, the Trabus Institute in Toronto, the Blackbird Academy in Nashville. He published five books on music and sound technology. Uh, he had a great life. He lived with his wife, Sarah, in Metro East. He continued to play the Woolitzer organ at the Fox Theater and had a classic car collection, chiefly of 1950s-era Thunderbirds. Heil additionally performed his own organ music on the Lebanon, Tennessee-based international shortwave station, WTWW. That's a 100,000-watt station on uh, 5,085 kilohertz. Every Saturday at 8 p.m., he did that until 2022. Heil was the International Amateur Radio Broadcaster of the Year in 1982. Who was the International Amateur Radio Broadcaster of the Year in 1991? 
Barry Goldwater, <laughs> big shoes to fill. He was later awarded the 1989 USA Satellite, De Satellite Dealer of the Year by Satellite Broadcasting and Communications Association in Las Vegas at the show. In 1995, he received the very first Live Sound Pioneer Award at the Audio Engineering Society Convention in San Francisco. Heil won the Pernelli Award for Innovator of the Year in 2007. Also in 2007, he was invited into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to put up a display of his historically important gear, which included the first modular mixing console, the Mavis console. Yeah, that was him too. Quadraphonic sound mixers, that was him. And the very first Heil Sound talk box. He was the first manufacturer ever to be invited into the hall. In 2014, Bob Heil was awarded an honorary doctoral degree for music and technology at the University of Missouri. He died of cancer in Belleville, Illinois on February 28th. He was 83. Such a life, such a giant in the industry. And I do have a regret. I've said on my podcast many, many times, I, I live with uh, with no regrets. That's not necessarily tour or true. Uh, one regret I had, it's really not one I can, uh, uh, it's a regret, but it's a regret with an asterisk. I never interviewed Bob Heil and I really wanted to. And the reason I didn't interview him is there's only 24 hours in a day. I'm still working the day job. I'm doing tons and tons of stuff. And I never got around to calling him arranging something and interviewing Bob Heil on the James Strong Show podcast. It would have been a huge coup if I had. I think he would have done it if I would have asked, especially if I said, hey, Bob, I'm talking on one of your microphones. I'm listening on one of your headphones. I'm sure he would have gave me 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes, but it never happened. Bob Heil, rest in peace. That's it. I'm done. James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. That's the email address. James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. Check it out. Share the podcast with your friends. Send them an email. Say, hey, listen to this knothead. He's not half bad. I mean, maybe half bad, but he's half good too, okay? <laughs> so send a link to a friend. See what they think. That's how we can grow the podcast. If you do that, I appreciate it. And I do answer all my emails. I got more this week. I get some every week. I always answer them, okay? That's it. I'm done. Until next time, this is James Strong saying adios.